everybody, Josh the RV Nerd of Vicious RV here with a, um, a, just a raw peeling the onion back layer by layer discussion on the topic of frame flex in RVs. What it is, what it means, where it's happening, how it's happening, how you can try to avoid it, and all kinds of stuff here. This is a very hot button topic in the industry, and I've, I've taken my time to come about uh, chatting about this because I've spent the last two or three weeks uh, having conversations with uh, things like RV manufacturers, uh, a lot of different owners who have been affected by this, um, a as well as like, you know, not just chassis builders, but even raw material suppliers digging in through all kinds of different contacts, making new contacts and connections to try to get you as much information about this as possible. So that leads me to my goal today. And I thought really long and hard about how to go about this because uh, the, the way that a lot of folks have been asking me to dive into this, they, they're saying, Josh, look into this, who is to blame? And that's a, actually a very complicated answer. And uh, right now someone's rolling their eyes. So I want you to know that uh, along with that, I think that people like me and or dealerships actually do shoulder some of the burden on this. So if that's not kind of being clear and candid about this, I don't really know what is. So I spent a lot of time talking to a lot of people and I decided I think the best way I can go about this is the same way that I go about all my videos. I'm just going to get, I gathered a ton of information. I'm gonna lay it out for you. I'm going to uh, peel this apart layer by layer so that you understand what it is, what's happening, what the cause is. And along the way, my goal is to educate you on how to uh, protect yourself from this, to shield yourself from this and avoid this happening to you because it's an awful thing when it happens to you, you know? Um, I'm not going to uh, point specific fingers at specific parties. I'm not going to ever uh, direct a, a name toward any certain dealership, owner, manufacturer, anything like that because this is a far wider spread problem than pointing blame at just one or uh, two little people. There's a much, much bigger conversation to have here. Now, as I always do, I'm going to chapter mark this video so that you can jump around to it, uh, you know, as you please. And if what you're looking for is just the Cliff Notes version of this, skip to the too long, didn't read section of the video where I'm gonna break it down and oversimplify it way too simply just to give you some quick answers. But I really, really implore you to stay tuned through this whole thing. And I think if you do, you'll see what I'm talking about, what is going on, how we got to where we are, and again, how to educate you to help uh, avoid this happening to you in the future. So first of all, what is frame flex? Because not everybody knows about this or what's been going on. And I think that if you're a prospective buyer or an existing owner, it's important that you fully understand all this. So anyway, what we're not talking about is frames flexing because some people uh, have said, well, aren't frames supposed to flex? Well, yeah, a little bit, they have to. What we're talking about is not frames flexing specifically, we're talking about them flexing excessively. So if we're gonna call a spade a spade and a duck a duck, we are discussing frame failure. It is getting out of spec and not doing the job uh, it was kind of supposed to do. Um, I'll, I'll use the words frame flex through this video just because that's the generally accepted term. But what's happening is somewhere something is bending, twisting, buckling more than it's supposed to uh, and it, it's going beyond its expected uh, abilities to handle that and things are bending too much to the point that something starts to break and you end up with a very significant problem. And although it is technically something that could happen to uh, essentially any RV, um, what we're really talking about discussing in this video has been uh, the more recent uptick and um, you know noticeable occurrence within the really big fifth wheel market, that really large like 40, plus, uh, 40 foot plus big fifth wheels and toy haulers. That seems to be where a lot of this is happening. The big units that are moved with high frequency, that's where we're seeing the greatest instance of this. It's not that it hasn't been happening anywhere else, it's just that that seems to be the greatest concentration. So that's really what we're gonna primarily focus on and talk about today is uh, those kind of RVs in that big size market. So how often is this happening? Well, if you get around the internet and you look around right now, it looks like it's happening a lot. I, I it sounds like I'm discrediting things when I say that. I'm not. It's happening, I think, more than any of us feel that it should, okay? You know, let's, again, I'm just trying to share the information that I found. I'm not putting judgment into it at this stage. 
Uh, I'll, I'll share my views, my opinions, and my advocacy later in this video, all right? Uh, for now, if you look around on the internet, it looks like it's happening all the time. If I uh, contact various RV manufacturers, they uh, often say almost exactly the same thing across all kinds of different brands, that they're seeing less than one half of 1% of their RVs experience this, um, and that is primarily concentrated, again, in those big, giant fifth wheels and toy haulers. It does not seem to be a big widespread problem across the industry. So there's two very different, almost answers, opinions, impressions right there. I suspect the real answer is maybe something a little bit in between. So where in the RV is this happening? Um, in, in two primary areas and in one most common case, I guess is the best way I can say that. First of all, the uh, the pin box area up here, almost lost my balance. The pin box area up here is where you're tending to see the greatest number of cases of it, where basically what happens is not that the pin box breaks off or anything like that. It's just that like you start to see the pin box moving slightly independently of the rest of the RV as you're going down the road. Stuff is moving and this pin box is not supposed to be uh, wiggling uh, independently of the RV body itself. The other area that you're tending to see uh, somewhat uh, consistently is this area right here. This is called the riser on the chassis. This is where it goes from the lower level, rises up to the top level. I wonder if that's why they call it that. But uh, this area bending uh, to an unexpected degree is the other area this is happening most. But again, where this is happening most frequently in these areas is uh, the big giant heavy fifth wheels that are moved around with high frequency. Stuff that um, isn't super big and heavy, stuff that isn't moved around a lot, is not tending to see this. There's definitely instances of it. I've personally seen instances of it. I've had people report that. I'm not discrediting that. But the biggest conversation out there right now is related to these two things right here. So how do you know if this is happening to your RV? How do you know if you're affected? There's several different telltale signs. One of the most prolific and most obvious is that you'll actually see a crack in the fiberglass, usually around a slide out because that tends to be an area of the highest amount of stress. But I have seen some going basically down the middle of a wall, starting at the, 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 the roof line and kind of working its way, cracking its way down the wall as like, It'd almost be like if you took a rigid piece of celery and tried to bend it, eventually it's just gonna go snap, kind of like a number two pencil, you know what I mean? Again, one of the other major telltale signs that you can run into here is the uh, the pin box um, moving, twisting, flexing differently than the rest of the movement of the RV. And one of the easiest ways to see that uh, commonly is when you are lowering the fifth wheel down onto the truck's hitching system, you actually watch the, the hitch nose up a little bit because it's it, the structure's not holding it flat and rigid the way it's necessarily supposed to. Now, there are certainly some other symptoms that you may see, um, such as like, you know, cabinetry suddenly having weird fit and finish, trim popping loose, things like that. Those are all other potential symptoms of the fact that something is no longer holding square the way that it used to be. So how, how can that all happen? How can those things occur? This is where I need you folks to bear with me and remember, I am not trying to tow some corporate line right here. Uh, what I'm about to say is not trying to shift blame uh, to any specific party. I'm about to list off a bunch of factual reasons how this could happen. Why is another conversation that we're going to have later in this video. Because again, I'm not unsympathetic to the fact, I'm not trying to diminish the fact, uh, you know, uh, saying like, well, only half of 1% of RV chassis in this big segment are having issues. Um, yeah, that's easy to say when you, when you have that, that the benefit of giant scale. When it's you again, the owner sitting there with $200,000 maybe of RV tied up in RV jail, it's absolutely awful. I'm not unsympathetic to that. So I'm not trying to diminish anything. I'm not trying to blame anybody. I just want to explain some ways that this can happen. So don't cancel me. Remember, I went out of my way at your request to gather all this information and put this out there. This is a big, scary topic that is not fun to go through whatsoever. But I will tell you, I have learned some serious stuff going through this. Some things that I had wrong before this. And we're going to talk more about uh, that later. Anyway, um, one of the first suspicions I had when I heard all about this was bad steel. Uh, I started asking the question, um, what are the average model years that are being affected? When were they produced? Because what I suspected was there was a trend of 2020 to 2022 RVs that were being affected here. And I highly suspected that during that era, 
uh, some things got pushed through that shouldn't, and I really estimated that we had imported maybe some bad steel that was, uh, you know, built and sent out, and after a couple years started to get tired and started to bend in ways that it wasn't uh, supposed to. But interestingly, what I found out is it doesn't sound like that was the case, actually. Uh, I, I Again, I've talked to um, RV manufacturers, chassis suppliers, and I know people who are involved in raw material supply for things that the RV industry imports. And they all pretty much said the same thing. We really haven't seen that. So I was like, oh, okay, so what is going on? So with that, again, I would mention that in my career, I have seen a few instances in which a frame just flat out did not do the job it was supposed to. It's not common, but I have personally seen it. And it definitely, in my experience, has seemed to be more of an isolated incident, but it absolutely can happen. So we're not gonna take that off the table, but I don't think that properly explains um, the focus and concentration of a lot of the discussion that's gone on recently. And again, remember, what I'm about to share are just facts and how this can happen. It's not saying it's anyone, uh, any one person's fault. We're just gonna boil down facts and then we're going to interpret all that, how it can apply. One of the more common reasons a frame can start to move and bend out of spec is that the RV has been loaded with too much weight. Um, uh, and again, we're going to get into how that comes to be um, because I'm not trying to point fingers and say customers are loading too much weight into stuff. It's it's not that simple. Um, I, I, you know, I kind of looked at this and anytime I run into something, I always kind of go, okay, what is a parallel I can encounter here um, outside of the RV industry? And I thought about when, you know, my wife and I had this little house and we got into our, our current home, which was much bigger. We're like, we will never fill this thing. And within like three years, we were giving stuff away, having the yard sale, donating things and all kinds of stuff like that because you just accumulate crap and you do it way more than you realize. Again, with my experience, I have definitely seen people, uh, you know, on new RV day when they're trading in the old RV, they'll park the two side by side, door to door, unload stuff from the old RV into the new RV and they think it'll take them like a half hour and it takes like six. And I've seen that so many times because we just don't realize how much stuff we have packed away eventually. Um, why would being in an RV for an extended period of time, why do we think that that would be any different? I, I don't know that it would be. And as, uh, again, I talked to a lot of different owners who shared their experiences. And I just asked them all some very basic questions, not trying to find blame or fault, but just looking for trends. And I would often ask, you know, um, did you ever have the RV scaled? Did you know what it weighed? And um, I'd say about half of people didn't, they weren't sure. And I, and I, I don't fault them for that. Cause I don't, I don't know. I've never scaled my RV. I've camped a bunch. I've never scaled the camper. Um, but it is possible that they could have had themselves overloaded and didn't know it again, how we get to there. We're going to talk more about that in a minute, but that is just a thing that can happen. Too much weight puts too much stress on it. Something is acting in a way that it wasn't supposed to, because it wasn't designed to hold that much weight. One of the other really common threads and trends, uh, especially in the case of pin box flex that I encountered talking to everybody, owners, manufacturers, anybody, was swapping the factory installed um, pin box, the king pin box, to a non-approved pin box uh, as it relates to that chassis. Something that a lot of people don't realize, uh, that I did not realize for many of my earlier years in this industry, was that you can't just necessarily change out the pin box for any old thing. Like, uh, I, again, I'm gonna put myself on the line right here uh, because I've learned a lot through this. I'm trying to help you learn and uh, get educated. Um, for years, my family's store, if somebody asked, yeah, we'd change out your fifth wheel kingpin for gooseneck conversion. And then later we found out that that's not a good idea. And we put some folks into bad positions with that, didn't know it. We did our best to help them through at the time, but that's a thing that really happened. But that's a thing that a lot of places still don't educate customers about. We've almost completely stopped doing that, only at a complete customer insistence that they want to change their hardware out, uh, you know, at, at, at our place. But uh, that is a real thing that can happen. Um, and again, if you think about it, where we're seeing the greatest concentration of this activity, this frame flex, frame failure, again, being real about it, is um, for the folks who are towing and going a lot with big rigs. Well, if you're gonna be on the road with a big heavy rig a lot, you wanna have a nice smoother drive down the road, not bang yourself around and, and stress your vehicle more than you have to. It makes sense you would change the pin box out. The, the hiccup here is again, 
uh, too many places are just all too happy to take a customer's money without educating them as to the possible consequences of making that swaption. And another thing that I learned going through this, I had never heard of this before, and once I had it explained to me, it made perfect sense. And that is using a non-traditional tow vehicle. I have flat told people, you can definitely have too little truck, but you can't have too much. That, I have learned, is not correct. Um, what I mean here is, uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that a, a fifth wheel RV kingpin system and a semi-trailer uh, kingpin system use the exact same hitch and coupler and everything. So a semi-tractor can literally hook up to a, a fifth wheel RV and pull it down the road. They marry up and they connect. Um, you would think, wow, man, with this big truck, uh, obviously I could pull this thing anywhere. Again, it makes perfect sense. I've never considered otherwise. But again, the thing is, those frames and structures on the RVs and everything, they are engineered with the expectation of things, again, referring to like a, a big giant fifth wheel segment, that they're going to be towed with something like a one ton dually, where the weight of the RV is properly activating the vehicle's suspension so that if you hit a bump on the road, a diminished amount of violence is distributed up into the chassis of the RV. Uh, the, the RV is structured to be able to handle that. When you have something like a semi-tractor that is capable of towing like 40,000 pounds and capable of handling vastly more weight, the suspension is so much stronger and more rigid that if you hit a bump, the suspension on the truck isn't even active and engaged yet and it's just translating straight up into the, um, the RV. Like uh, I used to work at Yellow Transportation, the orange trucks that were yellow, and a lot of my drivers absolutely despised bobtailing. That's when a semi-tractor is going down the road with no trailer hooked up to it. It is the single most dangerous time to be driving a semi-tractor. Uh, because your suspension's not activated and the truck isn't handling the way that it's supposed to. It's especially sketchy in adverse road conditions. That exact same everything 100% applies to towing a fifth wheel. So there are some instances in which some people have had more, more truck than the RV was ever engineered for. But again, I've done this for 15 years. I've never heard of that. How is an owner supposed to know that? It's, it's news to me. I would presume it would probably be news to you as well. The, the last major common trend and thread that I found out there was moving the RV around more than it was ever expected to be moved uh, or intended uh, by the manufacturer. Now, this right here is something uh, that we're, we're going to talk more about this in a minute uh, because there's so much out there suggesting to prospective owners or current owners or whatever that you can hook up to this thing and tow it every day anywhere you want with a problem-free philosophy hakuna matata and that is not what they're made for a lot of the people that i talked to that were experiencing the frame flex phenomenon uh in their big rvs uh had told me you know if we were just parked all the time this thing would be awesome sauce but moving it around a lot that's when we started to uh, in encounter challenges. Now, how much can you use the thing? Well, the problem is that's not really well documented. And RVs don't have things like an hour meter or an odometer or anything like that. That's actually one of the reasons I'm such a big proponent of like ABS systems, because they can actually do things like count tire revolutions and they can tell you uh, to a very fair degree of accuracy how much you have actually moved the RV and that may be something that we need in this industry to help people properly understand how to use their rigs or how not to use them but that information isn't really out there instead what you're led to believe is that you can take this thing anywhere you want all you want and nothing bad's ever going to happen to you <clears throat> and uh, the realism is from the manufacturing level they're not building it to be used that way so those are the common causes. How can you avoid them? I mean, some of this sounds obvious. If you know the cause, you know how to avoid it. But uh, let's let's go back through them one by one. Uh, in terms of uh, you know flat out frame failure, I don't know what you can do there. Because again, I've seen some very good brands, some very good manufacturers who consistently do go, uh, good work. A couple times in my career, I've seen one just flat fail. And I in those. I would say three instances I've seen it. I've seen the manufacturer really try to, to help make things right with people, um, but I haven't always seen a satisfactory uh, resolution to something like that, because that's an awful situation. That is just one of those lightning strikes, like you could go out buy an awesome brand new car or anything, and I don't know, there's just a chance that you got the lucky one, man. 
to avoid overloading the RV, I really highly recommend you uh, get yourself familiar with using uh, trailer scales. Um, uh, you can literally just Google trailer scale near me. You'll find things like cat scales or, or various options like that. You'll find the nearest one. Maybe you don't have one close to you. I don't know. But um, uh, that is a way that you can check this out. And here's another thing. I recommend you do that the day you take your RV home when it is dead empty with nothing in it I think you should go scale it to know exactly how much weight you're really looking at that because in my experience the brochure weight and the real weight are not usually the same thing now a lot of manufacturers will individually scale every single RV that comes off the production line and they will put that on a tag right on the unit most manufacturers do that did you know they're not required to do that it's insane to think about but all a manufacturer is required to do is to build one copy of an RV, the base model, and then measure that, and then weigh each individual option that could apply to that RV so that they know if it stays within GVWR, which it will. Um, they, that's all that they're really required to actually publish or put on their RVs. So understand, when you see a manufacturer who actually does scale each individual RV, that that is a sign that they're trying to do something. I, I think that there's more things to be done out there. Now, after you scale your RV when it's dead empty, and if you don't know how to read the scale tickets, it, don't, be, don't be worried about this. Uh, get on YouTube, read how do I read a cat scale ticket, and it'll tell you. It's not a super mystifying thing, but if you've never done it before, you don't know. You know, you don't, you just see these numbers you're like, how, what do I do with this? It's, it's, it's not hard. Um, maybe I should make a video on that. I don't know, let me know. The, um, thing here is after you get the RV home, after you load it with your stuff, you need to go hit those scales again so you know exactly how much weight you have in that. And I recommend you do this at least once a year because again, we have this ability to collect things over time. I have a personal client who left their sticks and bricks and, and spent months and months and months at a time in an RV traveling around for their work. And they did spend some other time, um, not necessarily full-time living in an RV, but they spent a lot of time in that RV. And he found out he was having axle and tire uh, problems. His axles were bowing, his tires were wearing funny, and he scaled it, found out he was overweight. Um, well, he went through and he started going on an RV diet and pulling things out of this thing. And he called me and he laughs, he goes, Josh, I gotta, I gotta tell you, I'm really just kind of kicking myself for this. I had two crockpots in this thing. Why do I need two crockpots? Because again, we just collect this stuff. We don't even realize we do it. And I'm not trying to shame customers. I'm trying to help educate you on how to avoid this. Learn how to scale your RV, do it at least once a year. And again, I recommend you do it when it's right away because here's the other thing. It is not at all known what the individual hitch weight of that specific RV is right there, especially after you put your cargo in it until after you buy it and you load it. There's no other way to know. And on that note, I, I cannot, I can't tell you, also because I haven't actually counted, but I can't tell you the number of times I've had somebody take my advice on that, take the RV that they just purchased from us, pull it straight to a scale house, because thankfully we have one only a couple miles away right here, and uh, run it across the scales and find out that their actual assembled RV's weight, completely empty of any all cargo, water, all that stuff, is sometimes notably higher than the published brochure weight, sometimes by several hundred pounds. Because think of even just this. What if you add a generator to the front of one of these big fifth wheels that's not a standard piece of equipment, that a manufacturer is not required to measure and publish in their brochure weights? None of that is ever reflected anywhere. Now, if they individually scale the RV, the amount of weight that that generator is pushing down on the total load of the RV is a measured metric, but how that affects the hitch weight specifically is never, ever documented anywhere that I've ever found. I've never found a resource where I can go as a dealer, look that up. I've never found an area on the RV that you can go find it as a consumer. It is never known until after you buy it and after you take it to a scale house. Now there are little trailer hitch weight scale things that are out there. That's that's a thing uh, for sure. Um, and uh, you know, I, I have provided information before in videos like this little two-step equation right here. What this can do is give you a fairly accurate estimation, estimation, not guarantee, of what your completely maximum loaded hitch weight on that RV might be. Now it's subject to where you load that cargo and how, because 
when you see a cargo capacity listed on an RV, that's assuming you distribute that weight completely evenly across the RV and not load it on one spot. Again, talking about these big, heavy, giant fifth wheels. You throw a generator up front, you have all that front storage, you have that giant drop frame storage cavity up front. A lot of weight is all loaded dead on the nose of that sucker right there. But that's a lot of it is weight that's added after it was built and it's not necessarily evenly distributed through the RV. And it puts you into a situation as a consumer where you have no way of knowing what you actually have in terms of actual raw, true hitch weight. So as it would be a really good idea to learn how to use trailer scales and to use them, I suggest annually. Now regarding pin boxes, that seems very obvious. My recommendation there is don't use a non-approved pin box. But how do you know it's an approved pin box? Get your RV's VIN number or the RV that you plan to purchase. Your salesperson should be able to get you that. And if a salesperson won't even get off their backside to get you a VIN number, that's not a salesperson. That's a lazy lump of sand. Um, <laughs> find a new one. Um, the uh, Get your VIN number and call your RV's manufacturer and ask them with this VIN number, um, are you approved to use any other pin boxes? And that is something that you can do before you buy the RV. And that may be an important factor in you making decisions as to whether you want to purchase that RV or not. But that's something that a lot of people never knew was a thing or that you could do. And again, regarding the um, non-traditional uh, tow vehicle or the too much truck conversation, this ha you have to get pretty extreme with the truck for that to be an issue. But essentially understand that mainstream big RVs are kind of built with the expectation of say like something like a one ton dually. If you start getting beyond that, you can start to encounter a truck that is just way too capable uh, in terms of uh, what the RV was expecting to be hitched up to. And this whole thing, matching up the truck with the trailer, this is like a minefield inside of a minefield. Cause I feel like I'm tiptoeing through a minefield right now. Cause I'm trying to just present information, but man, there's, uh, I, I get it. This is a hot button item. And I, I definitely have certain feelings about it myself, but trying to get proper towing information out there. Oh my Lord. That's a whole nother thing because vehicles are like a religion in our country. And, um, Man, you try to get on something like a Facebook or an owner's group and ask a tow vehicle question, and it, wow, you, you you get the people who are full send it, brother. Or like you ask the question, what size truck should I get for this fifth wheel? And someone says, well, my 16-foot trailer I tow with a half ton. Well, that doesn't do me any good. That's not helping answer the question. So it's very difficult to try to get this information. So what I recommend for you, and, and, and it's also very difficult to try to get proper information very often from salespeople at both RV dealerships and vehicle dealerships because I have found um, too many instances in which both were painfully undereducated and incapable of giving you correct answers. And I'm not flawless at this. I'm still learning stuff today. I've talked about that flat out right uh, here today. But uh, I, I think the way that you can kind of start to sniff out the correct information is ask that same question several times of several people in several different groups and you, again, you can start to identify the common answers, the common threads and trends. If anyone else has any better suggestions, like if, if um, you know, you have a better suggestion regarding like measuring hitch weight or anything like that, man, let's use this as an opportunity to educate one another and let's just help grow and educate our community. You know, leave some comments. Let's, let's compare notes as a class and get that out there. Cause frankly, folks, I think I have learned more from you than you've ever learned from me. And I sure appreciate it. So we've identified the what. We've talked about the how, but why is this happening? I've thought really, really hard about this part of the video. And I think that if we really find the common trend through all of this, it is a lack of clearly presented and easily accessible information available to everyone, everyone. Uh, whether it's a mystery hitch weight or the fact that you're not supposed to tow the RV that much or anything like that. There's, there, there's so little of that information readily out there for you. Like I've tried to put out videos on like helping you know how much your RV or how much your vehicle can actually tow and stuff like that. But the, the fact is, you know, all this information is out there, but it's either not easily found or it's too technical 
to be easily understood by many consumers you know like if you there, there's just there's just so many things that need to be broken down more simply and presented more obviously to people i feel so strongly that if more information was readily available and easier to access that we would have uh far far less of this because i think one of the major uh problems that's persisting through all this is that people are using their rv based on an illusion of a dream of how an RV can be used, but not the real way that RVs are actually used or supposed to be used. But how are you ever supposed to know that when that's not how anything is ever presented? So I want to advocate for and encourage current and prospective potential RV owners to empower yourself and educate yourself on as much as you possibly can uh, and don't take just my word for stuff. Please get other things because, um, you know, there are there are people out there who are trained incorrectly. There are people out there who will say anything to get your money. And there are people out there who really know their stuff. And then there are still people out there who really want to do correct by you and do well by you. But either they were trained wrong or misunderstood or didn't know and unintentionally may have provided you the wrong information. Real talk. That last one describes me. I've never tried to go out of my way just to fleece someone for their money. I've, I've never given someone bad information uh, that led them to a purchase on purpose. I've done this for a while though, and I've learned a lot over the years. And I think a sign uh, that someone's willing to grow is they're willing to acknowledge what they've done wrong. And I have provided people with incorrect information. I've done it before in my videos. I've tried to throw retractions. I've tried to make things right where I could. Not everyone is as interested in doing that. And very often, when you visit places like dealerships, whether it's RVs, vehicles, whatever, it's like uh, there, there's a high turnover rate. Um, and until someone spends a lot of time doing this, they don't really gain that really good in-depth uh, information based on just hard nose experience. Experience is nothing more than how many times you've been kicked around the block. My father used to say that all the time, and I have a hard time disagreeing with him. And don't you hate it when your parents were right, guys? But the fact is, uh, it is a really good idea for your protection as a consumer to educate and empower yourselves. And it's not that you should have to do a homework assignment to buy an RV. It's that I think it is a wise investment for you to do that because it helps you find the right RV. I always try to help people find their second RV the first time. It's easier said than done. It helps you be in a better position to do things like that. It helps you avoid problems like the one that we're discussing today but it is not, nor should it ever be exclusively up to an RV owner to, to, to do all the work. They should not be shouldering that burden alone. I, I, I want to encourage RV manufacturers to uh, share more resources, share more information relating to your RVs, such as like real, actual specs, weights, and measures. Whether it's that mystery hitch weight that no one talks about, it is absolutely within the capability of RV manufacturers to publish uh, to, to put a sticker on that RV telling us what the hitch weight empty and it, you know because they don't know how you're going to load it but they can at least tell us the real world exact empty hitch weight of that RV right there but I'm not aware of any that really do maybe there's a few I'm really not aware of it um, I, I want to encourage manufacturers to uh, to create and share more resources I, mm, I don't want to name anyone's name like no I want to but I'm not going to I was on a manufacturer's website today and uh, I clicked on their warranty tab and this big giant empty blank page loaded with like 10 words at the top said, see your dealer for full warranty information. The manufacturer won't even tell you about the details of their own warranty in some cases. Some certainly will. I'm not, I'm not, ah, this is not a blanket thing. You, I'm sorry, you can tell I'm a little fired up here. I've been shouting at the camera a lot. Um, I implore, plead, beg, not any one specific, all RV manufacturers to please publish more information on your RVs and realistic things. I encourage you to move away from uh, so much of this phrasing and dialogue related to full-time RVing and um, uh, four seasons or all seasons, all weather RVing. 
uh, because uh, I, 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 I don't care what piece of magic foil you put in the RV somewhere, that when it's negative 57 in South Dakota, no RV is made for that. No RV can handle that. But people are attempting to use them under the expectation that they should be able to do so because it was suggested that they could. Um, and that's, I, I, I think when you say it out loud, I think anyone hears that out loud goes, well, yeah, that's a problem. But it has persisted for so, so long. And it's, uh, uh, it, it's within our power to change. It's not an impossible thing to change and correct. Um, the, uh, you know, e explaining clearly what the expectation and intention of an RV you make uh, is in plain, simple to read words for a prospective consumer uh, would be great because, you know, er otherwise everything's the best and how's anyone ever supposed to know or understand, you know? There's all kinds of different things. They're all made for different reasons and purposes and they all have some really fun, fun aspects to them. But if we don't set expectations properly, then we're going to have poor experiences uh, accumulate. And that's kind of what got us here today. But it's not just customers. And it's not just uh, suppliers or assemblers or manufacturers that have a hand in this. RV dealers are not off the hook in terms of their responsibility in things like this or anything like it out there either. And that to me feels like a major piece of the equation that I've yet to hear anyone ever talk about. And uh, what I mean by that is um, regardless of anything that's happening, regardless of anything that any other party does, I feel so strongly the RV dealers have the greatest capacity to immediately impact and, and diminish, resolve problems like this because they have access to the most information coming from the most parties all at the same time in terms of, you know, we, we have various manufacturer related information. We have information from consumers coming at us and we're sitting there in the middle. We have the greatest ability to lead the charge on educating customers properly. Because, and I feel so strong, like we have almost a fiduciary style responsibility here. A customer comes to us because we're supposed to be the educated people on this and if they're not steered correctly, how can you blame a customer for that? I, I don't know that you rightly can. And while some dealers are great about this, uh, there, there are some absolutely awesome, awesome dealerships out there that uh, do a great job of this. I think one of the really good litmus tests, by the way, if, if you call, I don't care if you wanna buy like a little pop-up, call them and say, yeah, I'm interested in like the biggest, heaviest fifth wheel that you have out there. And if they um, don't immediately say, okay, what are you towing with it? If that's not one of the very first questions they ask, get away from them, you know? And there are some places that absolutely do that correctly. And I commend you. I absolutely commend you. I won't tell you we're perfect either. You know, we are constantly trying to improve that. Uh, we have our own internal like training system trying to uh, uh, correct that. We're not perfect either. But I, 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 I think customers need us to be better, you know? Um, and uh, as, as dealers, we have, um, uh, I want to ask dealers, please stop pushing this false information. Like stop telling people that a 35 foot triple slide fifth wheel is half ton towable. Stop pushing this four seasons agenda. All this, uh, like don't perform modifications to RVs and swap out their pin box to something that's not approved without at least giving the customer the education and choice in the matter. Um, I, I just, I would encourage every staff member at every place uh, that, that does business out there to please educate yourselves on the proper ways to take care of customers out there because that is just not something that I, I feel is out there on a big mass focus. And I hope you appreciate that, um, you know, it, it's not about pointing fingers. It's about recognizing where things can be, need to be improved and the average level of education uh, for the average person working at an RV dealership is absolutely, unequivocally, one of those things that can and should, it needs to be improved. So whether you've watched this whole thing so far by now, or whether you just uh, skipped ahead like one of those um, choose your own adventure books to this, the do, uh, too long did not read section of the video, the Cliff Notes super fast version of this is this frame flex, frame failure, a thing that is happening. Yes. Is it happening with great frequency? No. Is it happening with an acceptable level of frequency? 
I do not feel it is, nor have I spoken to anyone who feels things are happening to an acceptable level. Can it be avoided? I feel mostly, yes, through proper education and distribution of information. But again, I'm not like standing here claiming to be some authority. I'm not trying to be some YouTube truth warrior who's yelling at his phone from the dashboard of his pickup or something like that. Um, I'm trying to do my best to um, enlighten, to share information, to, to, to assist you in understanding what is happening out there. I love RVing. I love the camping lifestyle. But there are some flaws out here that I think could be resolved or greatly diminished. So, I mean, if you appreciate the fact that we're willing to go way out of our way to talk about a big scary subject like this, the kind of thing that uh, somebody hears about could lead someone to say, maybe I don't wanna buy an RV. If you appreciate that we're willing to dive into that for your benefit, at least click that like button. Leave me any comments you have about anything. If I've gotten something wrong, if you have other questions, I'll do my best to catch up with you in the comment section. Um, if you like what we're doing, you appreciate that, maybe hit the subscribe button and please share this video out there to anyone that may has heard about this or is concerned about it because I, I, I want the, the best information possible getting out there so that you as consumers are in the best, most educated position to, to make your decisions. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I, I want to try to move away from the unacceptably accepted norms that are sometimes found out in the industry and that's I guess one of the things that we're trying to do here today so thank you once again for tuning in I'm sorry I shouted quite a bit but there's there's some big there's some big topics here and there's some greater conversations to be had so until then take care stay safe have fun and happy camping everyone <laughs>